What is Bitcoin? Why is Bitcoin? What are these other cryptocurrencies involved? Is that moon behind me a metaphor? All this and more in today's video. Rolling track. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to a man who's lost all his sponsors. My name is Evan Edinger, and today we're going to be talking a bit about Bitcoin, because I feel like the average person doesn't really understand much about Bitcoin or why it's so revolutionary. So my goal here is to tell you why I myself am so incredibly excited about Bitcoin and all the other cryptocurrencies out there. And even though that just happened, I'm not an advisor, all right? I'm not a financial advisor. So please uh, take what I say here and then do your own research afterwards. I'm not responsible for anything you have to do after this video. Let's just take this for educational purposes. Let's go. All right, so to better understand Bitcoin, I think it's really important to start with why Bitcoin needs to exist. A lot of people in the media will constantly be just looking at Bitcoin, specific at the price and go, big number gets bigger, big number gets smaller. And it's a lot bigger than that. Bitcoin is the world's first cryptocurrency. And though its original purpose was to be used as a currency to exchange for goods and services, nowadays it's mostly seen as a store of value or as a hedge against inflation. For instance, rich people don't often hold as much money as they do appreciating assets like gold or safe stocks. And this is because these assets increase in value over time as opposed to the value of cash, which decreases due to inflation. Uh, for instance, if you had $1,000 in this year, 2021, and squirreled it away in a bank account and said, I'm not gonna open it for 10 years, the value of that would decrease by 28%, meaning that even though you visit visibly have $1,000, it could only purchase you $720 worth of goods in the year 2031. If it sounds like a rig system, well, that's just how it works. Whereas cash used to be backed by something that is globally treated as having value, namely gold, whereas when you're exchanging a bill, that bill represents an amount of gold that is kept in a safe by the government, uh, cash in today's day and age is actually backed by nothing. Cash today is literally backed by Nothing. That's right. The US dollar, great British pound, most all currencies currently in circulation in the world are actually fiat currencies. They're backed by nothing other than your belief in the government and the economy that produces it. And that what they say it has the value of, it has the value of. And this is what allows the US Federal Reserve or Bank of England to just constantly print more money whenever they need it. Hyperinflation, like what we've seen in Venezuela, was caused by a shaky economy and a government that tried to solve the problem by just printing large amounts of money as a stimulus. However, what they found was that by increasing the supply so drastically, it meant that the value of all of the bills currently in circulation went down as well drastically. And now people that were saving Venezuela Venezuelan currency found that what they had was valued at near pennies. That could never happen in the US, I hear you competently declare, thanks to your years of patriotic education. Well, okay, but did you know that 20% of the US dollars currently in circulation were printed last year? I'll repeat that, 20%, one out of five, of the entire US dollar circulation printed last year. Oh, interesting. Also, in June of the past year, the US Federal Reserve printed more money than was ever printed in the first two centuries since the US was founded. US having money problems? Don't worry, they'll just print some more money, making the one that you guys have worth even less. Enter Bitcoin. Bitcoin is a global deflationary currency, meaning that instead of the value decreasing over time, it is designed to increase over time due to its static supply. There will only ever be 21 million Bitcoin. It's in the code. There's no magical Bitcoin printer that's going to just produce Bitcoin out of thin air past 21 million. There's no mountain of hidden Bitcoin gonna be found in mind, unlike gold decreasing everyone's value. There will only ever be 21 million Bitcoin. But wait a minute, I thought you got more Bitcoin through mining. Well, currently of that 21 million, there are 18.6 million in circulation with the remaining 2.4 million Bitcoin slowly being mined out over the next 120 years, roughly. If you'd put your $1,300 US stimulus check that you received in May, 2020 into Bitcoin, a mere nine months later, you would have $6,500 worth of Bitcoin. Cause you know what they say, one Bitcoin is always worth one Bitcoin. But Evan, I hear you ask, I still don't get it. What is Bitcoin? Isn't it just invisible money? Does it even exist? How does it work? Well, currently, when you want to send money to a friend, chances are you're probably not sending anything physical anyway. The process generally is you instruct your bank who holds your bank account, who holds your money, to then send some of the value from your bank account to your friend's bank account at the bank where their money is stored. So our current system relies on centralized banks acting as middlemen and having a fun time with our money when we're not using it and only occasionally causing the entire economy to collapse. Bitcoin takes away the need for these middlemen. You do not need a bank. You do not need anything. You own Bitcoin. You are your own bank. How does it work? Hello, I'm Guy from the Coin Bureau, and I'm here to help teach you how Bitcoin works. Are you ready? Let's go. Let's say you have three friends. Wait, you do talk about crypto, don't you? Okay. 
Let's imagine you have three friends. We'll call them Phoenix, Bliss, and James. Each of you has a Bitcoin wallet with a certain amount of money in it. And one of you has a bright idea. Why don't each of us keep a record or a ledger of how much we all have? And we can call that first page a block. This is just a piece of paper. It's a metaphor. Where's that voice coming from? Never you mind. Anyway, where was I? Ah yes, so now that you've all got a copy of your ledger history, if someone untrustworthy, like James, starts shouting, Actually, I've got 22 Bitcoin. You can all look at your ledgers and say, No you don't, James. We have the entire history right here. You've got zero Bitcoin. Sit down. What a sad little life, James. This basically makes sure everyone is always in agreement about how much they have. You know what? I think I'd like to give one whole Bitcoin to Bliss. Before doing so, Evan updates his ledger and shouts to everyone else that has a ledger. I'm giving one whole Bitcoin to Bliss. Bliss then confirms. Hey guys, that's true. I can confirm. Add it to your ledger. At some point, you run out of space and need to start another page or block and add the previous one to your really long chain of previous blocks in your ledger or blockchain. Oh. So because it's a connected chain of all of our previous blocks, it's a blockchain. Yes. So wait, how can we be sure that beyond a shadow of a doubt that everyone's ledgers here are exactly the same before we add another block to the blockchain? Well... The process of adding a block to the blockchain and verifying that the entire history of all transactions is valid is a bit too complex of a thing to talk about in this short educational video, but if you want to know more about it, I'll supply a link in the description. That's where the term Bitcoin mining comes from. It's basically computers solving intense mathematical equations specifically to validify the blockchain. Validify? Validify? Computers are doing a lot of math and proving that things are valid and therefore get rewarded for it. Ta-da. And that's basically Bitcoin. You have control of your funds. No one else does. Well, as long as you're using a non-custodial wallet. But the, yet again, something not for this video. Instead of scanning your credit card and having Visa check that you've got enough invisible internet money, you can just send your own invisible internet money. And the more people, and the more companies, and the more cities, and the more countries, Adopt Bitcoin, the stronger the use case comes for Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies in general. Basically, the stronger the demand on the static and fixed supply, the higher the price. It's literally basic economics. But, and now we get to this part of the video, Bitcoin is not perfect. It's simply the first of its kind. As I said earlier in the video, Bitcoin is now seen as a store of value as opposed to as, you know, a traditional currency. And the main reason for that is, it's pretty rubbish as a currency. In its current state, Bitcoin is very slow to process transactions. And of those transactions, the fees are just way too high. And the entire proof of work model that Bitcoin is based on involving Bitcoin mining uses quite a lot of energy and is very inefficient in that regard. Developers are currently working on layer two solutions for these problems, but they've been working on them for a very long time and so, I don't think things are going to be changing too fast for Bitcoin anytime soon. Bitcoin is often described as digital gold, and I think that analogy works really well if you consider its use as a currency. Imagine having to find some gold in a mountain and paying for miners to go really far away, dig giant holes, try and find some, bring that back, refine it, and then going to a Starbucks to pick up a flat white and having to break off pieces of your gold in order to pay. It's incredibly inefficient, takes a lot of money, it's just not a good idea. But keeping it as a store of value well, that's onto something. Expensive and inefficient to exchange, but valuable to hold. Or hodl. One bit of FUD, or fear, uncertainty, and doubt that's pushed a lot as a narrative in the old media is that Bitcoin is primarily used by criminals, drug dealers, money launderers, mobsters. Now, anyone with a slight understanding of how Bitcoin works knows that is absolutely not true. Why? Well, there definitely is a preferred currency by all the criminals and drug dealers out there to make sure that no government agency knows what they're doing. The US dollar paid in cold hard cash. It's untraceable. That's currently what most people are using these days. So if you are someone that currently has any of those US dollars, you don't want to be in that company, right? You don't want to be doing the same thing that other criminals are using, right? Absolutely silly. Also, considering that we've already talked about this, everything is kept in the blockchain. So if you are a criminal that's sending Bitcoin, that is traceable. You might not know whose wallet is who, but once you find out, it's pretty easy to see where the Bitcoin is coming from. And that's why most criminals or drug dealers, if they did want to use cryptocurrency, would probably opt for more of a privacy coin, like Monero. 
That's right, there's more than just Bitcoin. But I simply don't have time in this video to give justice to all the different types of cryptocurrencies that I'm actively interested in. And so for you, I'm just going to quickly go over four coins that I think are really important and show the most promise. Ether is a coin on the Ethereum network. And what makes Ethereum stand out is that it's very similar to blockchain except it's more easily programmable with something called smart contracts, which has huge implications for business in the future. So as a quick example of this, let's just say I was trying to fund a film on Kickstarter. So I would set a goal of $10,000. You guys would pitch in small amounts and then, hey, I reach my goal. Kickstarter takes 10% of that. I get the rest. Good. I don't reach my goal of 10,000. Well, then all of you get your money back. Now, an example of how smart contracts can make that situation a bit better is I could just write a smart contract. You guys send money to the smart contract that only triggers that I get the $10,000 once the goal is reached. If it isn't, well, then the contract triggers the other way and you guys all get your money back. There's no middleman taking 10%. It just all works automatically with the joy of computer code. And that is just one example, but the possibilities are genuinely limitless. And you might say, well, why is that system so much better that this is so revolutionary? Because it's decentralized. You no longer have to go to this one company, this one authority. Everyone has the power to do this. And also, everyone has the power to write a dApp or decentralized app for Ethereum. The biggest problem with Ethereum right now is the insane gas fees. Basically, any transaction you want to make with Ethereum, any type of smart contract, the more complex, the more high the gas fees, which basically are how much you have to spend in order to enact that contract on the network. Now, these gas fees are getting so expensive because, well, in a good way, we've actually seen so much adoption. There's so many apps that are now using it. There's so much traffic and so much utilization, which is good for Ethereum. But what's bad is that the, the current proof of work model just does not work because it means that if I want to send, let's just say $2,000 to someone, it could sometimes cost $100 in fees. That's not going to work. However, uh, Ethereum luckily have an incredibly active dev team and they're already in the works of producing Ethereum 2.0. There's the EIP 1559 that's going to be going on forward. I'm speaking jargon at this point. Don't want to confuse you. Basically, they're switching to a proof of stake model in the next two years and all those gas fees are going to go down and the Ethereum network will be able to handle as much traffic as Visa. Visa. But if you can believe it, we are still very early stages. This system is constantly being developed and is constantly going to get better. So that's what makes me as an investor feel like, wow, I, I still am early because I'm seeing such progress down the pipeline. People are always like, oh, I'm too late to do this. I'm too late to do that. I'm like, they are still developing this to make it an actual competitor to like Visa and MasterCard and stuff. So like, no, you're, this we're still very early folks. Now I hear you, Bitcoin, it's too expensive. Ethereum, out of my price range. But this next coin, come closer, is only a dollar. And if my calculations are correct, this time next year, it'll still be a dollar. Enter DAI. DAI is one of the stable coins, which stable coin, I'm pretty sure you can work that out. It's a coin for horse girls. Uh, no, it's a coin that is programmed to be a specific value. DAI specifically is an Ethereum based one that uses smart contracts to make sure it's pegged to the US dollar. If the value of DAI goes up to more than a dollar, let's say a dollar and one cent, well then smart contracts enact to push the price back down to a pound. And if it goes below, a contract goes to make sure it pushes it back to a dollar. There are many use cases for stable coins that you might not be aware of. The main one that I know of at the moment is, let's just say you want to sell all of your Bitcoin, but you don't want to get out of the crypto space necessarily yet because maybe another coin interests you in the future or maybe the tax man's like hey you've got those those new dollars from selling that no 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 big tax event now you're just selling to another coin that's already a dollar you can reinvest it if you want or do whatever you want but that is the theory by the way that is what a lot of people do and just so you know i am not a tax advisor i'm not a financial advisor and so you should probably do more research before doing anything about this now speaking of stable coins they're actually quite useful for this next cryptocurrency ave which is finished for ghost look at his cute little ghost face Aave is an Ethereum-based money market for lending and borrowing digital assets. Think of it as a decentralized bank, because Aave is actually part of one of the fastest growing sectors in the crypto space, DeFi or decentralized finance. Rather than going to a bank and asking for a loan, in the future we'll probably just be able to use something like Aave, where money that's needed can be borrowed or lent with interest all via smart contracts. So instead of a small group of elite bankers earning a lot of money at our expense, we all contribute we all benefit. That is the glory of decentralized networks. It's taking power out of the few and giving it to the many. And you might be thinking, all right, well, if it is decentralized, who chooses the interest rates? How does anything even get developed for the platform? Well, actually, that is mostly done via smart contracts, similar to how when there's not a lot of Ubers in the area, but there's a lot of demand, 
Uber will tell the drivers, hey, we're surging, we're gonna pay you more, so then more drivers get on the road. If there's not a lot of coins being lent for a certain coin that they need more of, well, they'll just up the interest rate. Like, hey, you guys wanna start lending this coin? We kinda need some. At the moment, Aave can be used to earn a passive income from staking your coins. And that's one of the biggest use cases for stable coins right now. If we're looking at DAI in particular on the platform, the current APY of staking DAI is 16.3% APY. That means that if you put a thousand dollars worth of DAI or a thousand DAI into the protocol, by the end of the year, you would have earned 163 DAI or $163. Now that's a pretty darn good return, especially considering the 0.25% my high street bank is currently graciously offering me. So that's why systems like Ave seems so incredibly great and revolutionary because instead of these rich bankers running away with all the money and breaking the interest to save the economy, we're taking the power out of their hands. It's now decentralized. Now, before you go rushing off to your bank to convert all of your money to die, whoa, calm down. There are some risks. You'd be like, what are the risks? The value stays the same. For die specifically, the inherent risk is that something with the smart contracts will fail. Now, we don't know if that can happen, but there is always a risk with these things. And as I've said probably twice at this point, I am not a financial advisor, so please do your research. I'm not responsible if you go make bad decisions or good decisions, okay? You make your decisions based on your own thought process. However, that brings us to the fourth and final coin I think is interesting that you guys should learn about and it's incredibly important in the crypto space. That is the OG, the one that makes me feel stinky my good boy Chainlinky. Now, Chainlink is the glue that binds smart contracts to data off of the blockchain because smart contracts are going to be incredibly important for the future of the world, the future of how everything really operates. And so even more valuable than blockchain technology, reliable data. Let's just say you're a betting company. You're, you're a betting company and you, you got a couple bets out for the Tottenham game. I don't know why I always talk about Tottenham. It's because I used to live there. So let's just say Tottenham wins. You have a smart contract enacted and the people that bet that way get money. Hooray. But how do you know that Tottenham won? You need to have a reliable data stream. And let's just say you're using one source and that source, well, they bet the other way. What's to say they don't just, I don't know, change the data for that one little bit, make a lot of money off your smart contracts because smart contracts are the way they are. You cannot change them. Once they're written, they're code. And so you need reliable, decentralized data. It'd be like you asking a friend like, oh, what's the weather like today? And him saying it was cloudy rather than asking an entire network of weathermen what the weather is like. That is Chainlink. Chainlink is that Oracle solution. And I genuinely wish I could go into more detail about Chainlink, about Aave, about stable coins, about Ethereum, about all of these coins. But this video is already quite long and I do strongly want you to do some research on top of this video. So let's go back to the bed. Oh. The moon's out. Now, you might have noticed that throughout me describing each of these coins, I didn't really go into detail at all about the price of any of them, except for, of course, stable coins, where I feel like that is where it's kind of important. Because for me, the, the price, yes, is exciting. Things going up, hooray, money. But also what's more interesting is the tech behind it and how I absolutely see it changing the way the world works in more ways than one. How this technology will develop and become more intrinsically part of our everyday lives without us even knowing about it in the coming decades. And that to me is what's really interesting. And plus, if you really wanted to see that type of content where someone's just like, price go up, thousand billion dollars by end of year. I'm sure you could find that on YouTube if you look. I've heard the expressions, oh, it's too late for me to buy Bitcoin. It's already so high. And oh, I wish I'd put in more earlier, literally every single year since I've been in the space. Because we all know, yes, the best time to buy Bitcoin is in the past. But the second best time to buy Bitcoin is, you know, the present, because the present is the past of the future. <laughs> Does that make sense? I'm not able to give you any advice on where you should spend your money. All I can do is point you towards projects that I find interesting and I hope that you do some due diligence, do some research, learn about it, and make an educated decision whether that be to buy or not to. That's fine. Now, that being said, if you are at the part of your journey where you're interested in buying Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies and feel safe enough and educated enough to do so, well, the two easiest ways of doing that, in my opinion, are Binance and Coinbase. Now, Coinbase is an incredibly easy to use and intuitive app where all you have to do really is hook up your bank account or your credit card, bish bash bosh, pick which cryptocurrencies you want. Usually a lot of the big main ones are there and then you've got it. However, it is a custodial thing. So hopefully you've done enough research to realize like not your keys, not your Bitcoin. But if you want to sign up, 
I have an affiliate link in the description, which means no, I'm not sponsored, but we both receive $10 in free Bitcoin if you sign up. So it's a win-win. The other one is Binance, which is more of a giant exchange. They have all the traditional and bigger cryptocurrencies, but also the smaller market cap ones, the more risky moonshots. So I have an affiliate link in the description. If you're that far on your journey, you're interested in any of those, we both get a kickback. Anyway, thank you so much for watching. And though I may not be a financial advisor, I know it's hard to believe, I can advise you to subscribe to my channel because I make new videos like this every single week. I thank you for watching and I will see you next Sunday. Goodbye.